So, question two is, if our prefrontal cortex is sending us signals to inhibit our actions, to not act in the same way as we have seen others act, even though they are very influential figures in our lives, and we are young and our prefrontal cortex has not fully developed and we are flooded with emotion, how are we supposed to do what they say and not what they do? Um, there, this is a, 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 a complex sort of multi-faceted um, question, and I'll just pick out some of the main um, elements of it. This idea of um, the prefrontal lobes being there to prevent us from acting rashly on feelings. Uh, the, the prefrontal lobes are indeed developed in order to inhibit purely instinctual um, responses. Purely instinctual responses are very valuable things. That's the, our phylogenetic inheritance, tools for living, things that we just know um, when I feel like this, that's what I do. Fear, boom. Rage, boom. Um, and so on. But the world is much more complicated than these stereotyped instincts can, can um, uh, accommodate. And so we have to develop more subtle ways, more nuanced ways um, of behaving, guided always by the underlying instinctual feeling states, but um, allowing with thought, um, which the frontal lobes, uh, more than any other part of the brain, uh, facilitate, um, thinking up flexible solutions uh, tailored to the particular um, uh, nuances of the, of the current situation. So, yes, the frontal lobes inhibit impulsive actions, but where does this thinking come from that the frontal lobes um, uh, replace instinctual uh, impulsive actions with? Well, it comes from learning from experience. It's an internalization of how the world works. It's a forming of predictions as to what works and what doesn't work um, on the basis of experience. And um, in earliest childhood, that experience of the world, of how to meet our needs in the world, is mediated primarily, in the typical case, by parents. And so the internalization of what parents do for us um, is a very important part of what frontal lobe development entails, uh, especially in the early years and then again in adolescence when there's a massive spurt of frontal cortical development. So um, it's not a matter of the frontal lobes, um, to come back to the question, it's not a matter of the frontal lobes enabling us to not do what we see others do. In fact, the frontal lobes in their primary sort of maturational um, uh, guise, as, the, as they're unfolding, what they're doing is precisely internalizing what others do for us so that our frontal lobes can then take over what the parents do for us and our frontal lobes can do it for us ourselves. And we can internalize all sorts of, um, all sorts of unfortunate ways of dealing with our feelings. This is why uh, parental influences are so terribly important in, in mental health. Um, there's also this um, concept, the famous mirror neurons, which are primarily frontal, they are pre-motor, um, uh, uh, the, the secondary uh, cortex of the, of the frontal lobes is where the bulk of the mirror neurons are found. And what these mirror neurons do is exactly you know, monkey see, monkey do. What, what I see you do, I find myself um, sort of reflexively doing the same thing, a sort of, in, a sort of imitation or, or contagion effect. And this is a pretty reflexive, pretty automatic uh, sort of process. It's only with later frontal maturation, once we learn to speak, um, and around um, uh, the ages of five or six when we start to internalize this, become self-regulating in our cognitions, rather than our, our cognitions just being uh, um, sort of rote internalizations of what's been done for us, um, that an, an important additional step occurs then it becomes more voluntary what the, what the frontal lobes do. It's not so much just a, uh, automatically uh, echoing um, what we see uh, around us and what is, what is done for us, uh, a, a pure mimicking of, of that. It becomes a process of reflecting upon um, those processes in words. So internal speech, the internalization of a sort of symbolic system, which is one order higher in, in the hierarchy of abstraction. So it's not just feeling, 
nor is it just objects and things that one concretely does about the feelings. It's the ability to think about what one does about the feelings. This is the, this is the third level. And that's a crucial step in, uh, in prefrontal lobe development. Here we have the capacity to reflect upon what we're doing and thereby also to revise it. So we might have in the um, uh, earliest um, uh, layers or levels of frontal development, we might have internalized, uh, just sort of copying what's, you know, what, what did the questioner say, doing what, we, what, what, what uh, our parents do rather than what they say, uh, but the subsequent capacity to be able to learn to do what he said um, overlays that. Each of these layers of control is not to be um, overestimated. None of them is perfect. None of them is complete. There's always a force from below and there's a dynamic interaction um, between what the feelings coming from within and the learnt abstractions, the kind of rules of how life works and what matters and uh, how one should conduct oneself. All of it, this distillation and that abstract distillation of experience both of ourselves and of our families and of our cultures and of previous generations embedded within those cultures and so on. It's always a, a dynamic interaction between those two things. But I wanted to finish answering this question with this uh, point, that the capacity to be able to think about your thoughts, this, this, this re-representation of your concrete uh, embodied um, representation of what yourself in the world, uh, the, the ability to abstract and see yourself from the third person point of view, as it were, and think about what you're doing and think about um, uh, how, how you're acting. The, this um, capacity to make these more automatic, more concrete ways of acting, um, to make them, to, 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 to turn them into words, um, raises, it, it makes it possible, for, this, is, this is the mechanism whereby you're able to revise what you're doing by looking objectively, as it were, that is from a third-person point of view, looking back upon yourself as if uh, you, you were just another object. Uh, this same vehicle is what is used in most psychotherapies, the talking therapies. The talking cure is all about that, the, becoming aware through reflection, uh, becoming aware of what you do about your feelings um, so that you can have a second bite at the cherry, as it were, and, um, and try to change uh, those internalized automatic ways of doing what's been done and how you've always done things um, and uh, turning it into something more voluntary where there is more agency uh, to refer back to the previous week where we discussed agency. So thanks for that question. <laughs>